Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Yes, my name's Pete, and uh, I am an alcoholic, and uh, I always uh, look at uh, opportunities to uh, share my experience, strength, and hope in uh, meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous as a as an honor, as, a, as an opportunity, you know, to share my experience uh, with this program. And uh, tonight, um, the uh, subject matter is the second step, came to believe power greater than myself can restore me to sanity. And keep in mind, the implication here is that we're insane, okay? That's always a good starting point for, for anyone trying to get sober um, and live by spiritual principles. Um, I'm insane, certainly when it comes to and in relationship to the first drink. So uh, tonight, um, what really caught my attention um, when I saw this flyer go out and there were speaking commitments up for grabs, uh, my sponsor sent it around, was the way tonight's um, uh, uh, format was, was, was titled, the title of it, uh, What Now? And, uh, you know, if uh, you've, you've had an experience with the first step, you know, how apropos, you know, uh, what the hell do I do now and or what now or however you want to phrase it. But if I've done a good job in the first step and I've had an identification with the physical, the mental and the spiritual aspect of my disease, I've uh, I've come to the reality of what the hell do I do now? OK, you've convinced me. I have this physical allergy, I have this mental obsession, and I have this spiritual malady that always drives me back to the first drink. I call it the cycle of drink. It's very difficult for me to break that once I'm in it. It's either I'm drinking or or I'm not. You know, I'm I'm, I'm black and white in most all areas of my life, and, and particularly when it comes to alcohol and or drugs. It's either I'm doing it to oblivion or I'm not. I really never had a choice in the matter. All I knew was I wanted to get the job done, and I wanted to get it done fast. And so, you know, that's because I needed to relieve myself of me. You know, I found out very early in Alcoholics Anonymous what the problem was, and the problem was me. And then the problem with that was everywhere I went, I got there first. And so, you know, you can't never get away from me. I can't get away from me or I. I just can't, you know, it's, it just it follows, you, it follows me around. So having done a good job and having looked at that first step and having had the experience that uh, the book talks about, you know, I'm able to then look at the second step um, hopefully from an objective point of view, not from a, a cynic, cynical, closed down, opinionated, alcoholic point of view, which I'm very capable of, and I'm sure no one else in this room could get with that, you know, but it seems to be a kind of a leading characteristic or a, a common thread that I've found in working with other alcoholics through these steps is that we all seem to suffer from the commonality of opinionated, cynical, closed down, um, negative, the old, you know, the neghead thing uh, when it comes to spiritual principles. You know, die an alcoholic death, live by spiritual principles. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, I got to think about that. You know, am I am I really going to die an alcoholic death? You know, what does that really mean? To me, it means being alive but being dead. You know, today I understand what it means to be to be alive but to be dead, and. Uh, I think that only someone with um, an awareness of their disease um, and and having some experience in sobriety can identify with what that really means. I'm a walking dead man. And um, I die spiritually, mentally, um, um, long, long before I die physically. An alcoholic death is a slow burn. It's horrible. And we alienate ourselves from everything and anyone that we happen to love or think we know what love is. We have a love, but we're just completely separated from love. When we are living 
our active alcoholism, when it's a living part of, of who I am. And today I stand before you, my sobriety date is July 4th, 1995, and uh, I stand as a, a sober member of this fellowship uh, who believes in 12-step work, not only for my own life, but in terms of my life depends on my on my giving it away, whether it's in a, in a venue like tonight at a meeting or whether it's one-on-one -on -one with another alcoholic. So I wanted to approach step two tonight, and I wanted to look at it first from the standpoint of um, a newcomer and, and, and how this work is somewhat presented in terms of, of new people in Alcoholics Anonymous. Is there anybody in here with less than 30 days of sobriety who would like to identify Terrific. And, uh, and then there's everything in between, between 25, there's probably people in here tonight with 25 years of sobriety. And my, and, my, and my experience with that is it really doesn't matter. No one in this room is any closer to God than the person next to us. It just depends on what our relationship is with this power. If we choose to call it God, we find out in step two that it's a power greater than ourselves. We decide what it is. We find it. No one can tell us what it is. No one can take it away from us. That's the beautiful aspect of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is not a religious program. This is a spiritual program that's based on finding a power by which I can live that's going to solve my problem. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, I'm the problem. I always thought that the problem was I drank too much and that I had a, just a series of bad breaks and misunderstandings in this life. But as I stayed sober and I had an experience with these 12 steps, I got clear on really what the problem is. And the problem is me. So if I may, the way I'd like to approach it is I'd like to spend maybe 10 or 15 minutes reading certain passages, certain sentences, if you will, from step two, give you my interpretation of them. After all, I, I am leading the meeting, so I get to give you my interpretation. And then share with you, um, let's say, my current experience with the second step. And then kind of how the step uh, manifests or the manifestation of, of spiritual principles uh, in my life today. In, in my, just my general everyday life. And, uh, and how I uh, rely on those principles. So um, if you want to follow along, if you have a book, that's fine. If not... Um, I'll, uh, I'll just do some reading here and uh, give you my interpretation. So, naturally, if you've, nat I'm, gonna, I'm assuming that most people have, have read Chapter 4 in our big book, We Agnostics. So, I also found that interesting. You know, the step is, is named Came to Believe, but the, but the chapter is titled We Agnostics. So, there's an implication here that we all are agnostic. And so, if I think about that, you know, there is areas of my life where I'm agnostic. Anything that I'm not giving to God today, turning over to God, any area of my life is where I have my current agnosticism. So the, 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 the title of the chapter is apropos. So it opens up by giving us basically, if and when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, or if when drinking you have little control over the amount you take, you're probably alcoholic. Pretty broad and roomy. If that be the case, you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. Do I believe that? Turn that into a question. Do I really believe that I have to have a spiritual experience to conquer my alcoholism? To one who feels he's atheist or agnostic, such an experience seems impossible. But to continue as he is means disaster, especially if he's an alcoholic of the hopeless variety. To be doomed in alcoholic death or to live on a spiritual basis are not always easy alternatives to face. How do I feel about that? Do I believe that? Is that my experience? Is that the experience of the person that I'm working with? At first, some of us tried to avoid the issue, hoping against hope we were not true alcoholics. I identify with that closely. The last thing I ever wanted to be was an alcoholic. I didn't sign up for this. I came crawling in here as the absolute last resort, last place on the block. And many, many a night I remember driving home in the first six months of my sobriety just cursing you people in this program. I have to go to those damn meetings again, and I don't want to do this for the rest of my life, and I just want to be normal, and I just want her to come back, you see? After a while, we had to face the fact that we must find a spiritual basis of life or else. And I love the way they say that. After a while. 
after a while, I've been around here, I've decided that I can't do the second step, I'm just going to hang out in the first step and try and intellectualize it, but I can't take that second step. But after a while, I had to come to believe that I had to live on a spiritual basis or else. And alcoholism, whether I'm drinking or whether I'm not drinking, is typically going to beat me into a state of reasonableness where I, I just can't go on, whether drunk or sober. Our human resources, as marshaled by the will, were not sufficient. They failed utterly. That's another thing. I've got to ask myself, do I believe that? Does the person I'm working with believe that? Lack of power, that was our dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live, and it had to be a power greater than ourselves. But where and how are we to find this power? Well, later on in this chapter, it's going to tell us how and where we find this power. But it poses the question now. Well, that's exactly what this book is all about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself which will solve your problem. Again, your problem. And it means that we're going to talk about God. With here, difficulty arises with agnostics. We talk to new men and watch his hope rise as we discuss his alcoholic problem and explain our fellowship. But this but his face falls when we speak of spiritual matters, especially when we mention God. We know how he feels. We have shared his honest doubt and prejudice. This is all about identification in the early parts of, the, uh, of this uh, information in the, in the second step. Let us reassure you, we found that as soon as we were able to lay aside prejudice, express even a willingness to believe in a power greater than ourselves, we commenced to get results. Even though it was impossible for any of us to fully define or comprehend that power, which is God. Much to our relief, we discovered we did, did not need to consider another's conception of God. Our own conception, however inadequate, was sufficient to make the approach and to effect a contact with him as soon as we admitted the possible existence, possible existence of a power greater than myself. We began to be possessed of a new sense of power and direction, provided we took other simple steps. And my experience in here is it's one thing to have had a spiritual awakening. It's one thing to have had some type of a, you know, a spiritual experience with these steps. And it's altogether another thing to enlarge and perfect and to grow our spiritual experience. A lot of us are guilty of at various points in our sobriety of moving forward and then all of a sudden resting on our laurels and thinking, I did enough. I feel good enough. This is good. I'm okay. Great line, Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm okay. All right? If you're talking to anybody who's an alcoholic after the meeting, they say, I'm okay. Don't believe them. It's a lie. They're not okay. We're either great or we're really bad. There's very little in between for us. That's the type of people we are. When therefore we speak to you of God, we mean your own conception of God. The book keeps hammering home the idea that this is our own conception of God. At the start, this was all we needed to commence spiritual growth, to affect our first conscious relationship with God as we understood him, was to believe that there is just a power greater than ourselves. We all typically, and I don't like to generalize, but I'm going to, we want to figure out why this isn't going to work for us. I need to come up with an excuse why these 12 steps, I don't need them. That's not my answer. I don't need to do this. Well, when I get to the second step, it's perfect. I'm going to intellectualize it and figure out why it's not going to work for me. But the book, if we do a good job helping new people with this material, particularly this step, we have to explain to them, all you need to do is to believe that there's something greater than yourself out there in this world, whatever it is. For me, early on in sobriety, it was the group. It was my home group. That was a power greater than myself. The people in there seemed to be happy. They seemed to have pretty good lives. There were people who were gainfully employed. They were happy. They were being useful at meetings. You know, they weren't feeling sorry for themselves, you know, and, and in, the, in the pity pot like, like I was 24-7. So here we go. First half of the second step. We needed to ask ourselves but one short question. Do I now believe 
or am I even willing to believe that there's a power greater than myself? As soon as a man can say that he does believe or is willing to believe, we emphatically ensure him that he's on his way. It has been repeatedly proven among us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built. This is the most amazing chapter in this book, the way it's written. It's so spiritually based, so spiritually founded. I, I, I just get so much out of it every time I read it. We accepted many things on faith which seemed difficult uh, to believe. Besides a seeming inability to accept much on faith, we often found ourselves handicapped by obstinacy, sensitiveness, and unreasoning prejudice. I don't know if anybody identifies with that. Faced with alcoholic destruction, we soon became as open-minded on spiritual matters as we had tried to be on other questions. Sometimes this was a tedious process. We hope no one else will be prejudiced for as long as some of us were. The reader may still ask why he should believe in a power greater than himself. So they're talking about the reader. The authors are saying, again, they're asking us the question, why do I need to believe in a power greater than myself? If I don't believe in a power greater than myself, I'm not going to have enough gas in my tank to get through the rest of these steps. I'm not going to be willing to go into that third step and make a decision to finish this work. I still have power. I have power, uh, choice, control. I have those things in my life, not just in relationship to alcohol, but I'm convinced that I have power, choice, and control over what I think, that I can do it on my own. And if I really believe that, my self-will, they talk about in step three, is run riot. But I don't really understand what that means until I can really deeply look at myself and go through these 12 steps, which are perfectly constructed mechanism for recovery. My experience, they are absolutely the perfect mechanism for anybody with an alcoholic or drug addicted personality to recover by. This is the solution. And our responsibilities in here is to take the solution and give it to new people to introduce this program. It tells us, talk about the spiritual aspect of this program freely. Don't be afraid to talk to new people about the conception of God, how you found God. That's what, these, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. That's what we're supposed to do. Whether we choose to do it or not is an entirely different matter. But my responsibility, because this is my experience, is to pass on to you what works for me. And that's what I'm here to do tonight. Okay. I mentioned the first half of the second step. And this is the second half of the second step. The first half is pretty broad and Roman, you know. Uh, let me read it again real quick. We needed to ask ourselves but one short question. Do I now believe or am I even willing to believe that there's a power greater than myself? Well... If I, if I looked at myself and I was honest with myself in the first step, I'd have to say, uh, there better be a power greater than myself because I don't have any. In relationship, not just to the first drink, but to what I think. Think about that. Do I have power, choice, and control over what I think? When I have a resentment towards somebody, do I have power, choice, and control over what I think about that person or that situation? I'm hurt. I'm a victim. You know, I'm in, I have entitlement, you know, to my point of view. My integrity's been, been compromised. I mean, the list is endless. And all I'm concerned about is that resentment. Do I have control over that? My personal truth and experience with that is I have absolutely no power over that. Left to my own devices, on my own unaided will, I have no power over what I think. I mean, I, I get up in the morning and I brush my teeth and shower and stuff. And I, I go to work, you know, I'm pretty good with that. But don't hurt my feelings, you know. My, you know that's, don't, don't, don't go there, you know. So, the second step. The second half of the second step. When we became alcoholics, crushed by a self-imposed crisis, so, crushed by a self-imposed crisis. Don't you love that? 
We could not postpone or evade it. I'm crushed by a self-imposed crisis. I couldn't postpone it, and I couldn't evade it. It means I had absolutely no control over this runaway train wreck of a life. None whatsoever. We had to fearlessly face the proposition. Either God is everything or else he's nothing. He either is or he isn't. What's my choice to be? Interesting. If I look at it and I really get clear with that, that's one thing. That's my own personal experience with that information. In terms of helping someone else find their truth and help them through this process. It's like anything. I can't have the next step unless I've completed the current step that I'm, that I'm on. So am I really ready to go to the third step? You know, how do we how do we kind of measure that when we work with people? You know, well, did you did you take it? I mean, are, are you there? You know, you know, we, the, my tendency is I want to put words in the other guy's mouth. You know, I got all the answers. You know, I believe in a power greater than myself. Don't you? OK, let's go. You know, that's not it. I find that it's really very effective to get the person I'm working with to write and turn all these statements that I've been reading here tonight into questions and answer these questions on paper and then share that information with me if, if I'm the one working with them or with you if you're working with a sponsee. Get that person to share their understanding, their, their, their prejudice or their, or their point of view or whatever it happens to be and then try and help them get through if we need to go back to the first step and review the three aspects of my, my problem, okay, that's going to help me look at step two, at least from the point of view is all I needed to make a beginning was to believe that there's something greater than me. Don't tell me what it is. You know, don't tell me what to do with it. All I needed to do was believe there's something greater than me. But if I go all the way, the book takes me all the way around the tree into the second half of the second step, which either God either is or he isn't. God is either everything or he's nothing. And you see, why is it that way? Why is it stated that way? Well, I'm an alcoholic. Alcohol is either everything or it's nothing. What is my choice to be? Well, if I'm actively drinking, you know what my choice is. Alcohol is everything. I didn't understand a life without alcohol. What am I going to do? What will I be? You know, what will she be? I mean, what, what am I going to do with all my time if I'm not drinking? You know, how, am I, wh wh how does this life work? I don't know any other way. This is what life is. What's life without alcohol? And if you look at it from that point of view, we are so black and white. So why am I going to half-bake this thing in terms of the God of my understanding? It's been told to me. It's a God of my understanding. So God either is or he isn't. God's either everything or he's nothing. Why does he have to be everything? Well, I'm going to find out. If I stick around here long enough, I'm going to find out why God has to be everything. Because up until now, I've been everything. I often say that, you know, to walk around during the course of any given day and to be able to contemplate the presence of God to have a, have a God consciousness, to periodically or somewhat routinely pray or th give thanks or be grateful for the things in my life or whatever happens to be going on or asking God to give me the words or the direction to handle a particular situation. Having a God consciousness during the course of the day is my solution for living today. That's my solution for living. Because either I'm consciously contemplating God's presence or unconsciously it's my will. My will isn't a conscious decision. I don't wake up in the morning and say, today's my will. I'm going to go out there and knock them dead. I don't do that. Never did. Didn't have to. It's so deeply ingrained in me that that's just what I do naturally. God has to be everything. Now, that could be an intellectual decision. I can believe that, that intellectually that's the thing that makes the most sense. It seems to work for everybody else. The book's telling me this is what I need. Okay, you know, I can get with that. That's up here. But through prayer and practice 
and working this program, eventually it goes from here to here. And once that happens, I've had another spiritual awakening. And it's not difficult for me. I look forward to prayer and meditation. I look forward to helping new people. I look forward to all the, let's see, responsibilities in this program. It's a way of life for me, personally. So I pose the question to everybody in this room tonight, and certainly everyone doesn't get to come up here and, you know, stand and witness. That's not what we're talking about. But within yourself, to ask yourself today, whether you are one day sober or ten years sober, is God today everything? Because it's either he's everything or he's nothing. And what I tend to do is I tend to kind of keep God over here. Conveniently, you know, for when I'm in trouble. You know, because what happens is life comes up and hits me right in the side of the head. When I'm least expecting it, when I'm not, when I'm not looking, something in life like a boomerang hits me in the head and all of a sudden I had my feelings hurt. You know, I wasn't respected. I wasn't, well... We don't have to repeat the list again. We all are familiar with it. But that's the truth. But when I have God with me and present with me, those things bounce off me like a rubber ball. They have no effect on me. Unconditional love, you know. Say what? (laughs) Unconditional love? I don't think so. There's a condition on everything in my world, you know. I need it my way the way I want it. And I've found that it doesn't work that way. I can't have all the gifts of this program and sobriety without finding a foundation, a spiritual foundation. Remember it talked about a wonderful cornerstone can be built. A cornerstone. A cornerstone for my sobriety. A cornerstone for my life. The principles by which to live my life. You know, I'm looking for freedom. Freedom from me. I'm the problem. My mind, my dad used to call it a steel trap. I never understood what that meant, but I think it meant that once something got in there, it couldn't get out. I think that's what he was talking about, you know. I I could never figure out what a steel trap meant, but he, that's what he called me. Peter, you got a head, like a mind, like a steel trap. God damn it. You know, I mean, I I guess it's my, it was my plight right from the beginning, from a very early age. But I have to find a spiritual foundation by which to live my life. And this second step, I can read this every single day and I can get something different from it. Prepare me for my day. It could be a spiritual reading without any question. I'd like to share this from page um, 55. Actually... We were fooling ourselves, for deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. We finally saw that faith in some kind of God was a part of our makeup, just as much as the feeling we have for a friend. Sometimes we had to search fearlessly, but he was there. So how do we find God? By searching fearlessly. Sometimes we heard to search fearlessly, but he was there. He was as much as a fact as we were. We found the great reality deep down within us. In the last analysis, it is only there that he may be found. It was so with us. So how do we find God? By searching fearlessly. And where do we find God? We find God deep down inside within each and every one of us. So if the problem lies within, then the solution also lies within. If you're anything like me, and I have a feeling that you are, I spent my entire life working so darn hard, you see, and I'm not talking about going to work every day. I'm talking about managing everything. You know, it's a full-time job. You know, an active alcoholic, you know, I got, I got, I got, My private life over here, the secret life, you know, which involves all kinds of lies and, you know, schemes and, you know, things that I can't, you know, come clean with, you know, Uh, then I've got my, 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 let's say, upfront life, the one that I want you to see, you know, 
the one that I'm going to project, the one I want everyone to like, you know. And then I got the, the depressive one over here, the, 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 the one that feels sorry for himself and needs a lot of special attention, you see, in order to feel right. You know, I, I need your sympathy. I'll rec- I, I know how to recruit that. And, uh, and, I, and that's, that's my manipulative side, you see. So when you take those three components, that's a, that's a full-time job in itself. So, you know, I mean, what can I say? I mean, that's the way I, that's the way I, I roll. So, you know, I had, those, I had those all pretty well perfected there for, for a while. And then it started to all kind of start to crumble and, and kind of like a house of cards. And I, th- I think, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it had something to do with the, my, my uh, alcoholic progression. Uh, I was the type that started drinking at a young age. I, I know that surprises you, but it's true. Very young age, you know, about 15, the first time I got, I got loaded. But, you know, it's funny, too. The very first time I had, I had the opportunity, I went as hard as I could, you know, and I, and I passed out under the bridge where we all were. Um, well, I don't know what's up with that, but I look back on that. That was, I think, abnormal. You know, that's not normal drinking. You know, an allergy described as an abnormal reaction to alcohol. And by the way, the normal reaction is, I think I've had uh, two. I, I, I think I, uh, I'm not feeling so good. I think I'll, I'm uncomfortable. I'll stop. That's the normal reaction to alcohol. The problem is that we hung around with people just like us. So we thought that was un- abnormal, and what we did was normal, you see. And I found out in Alcoholics Anonymous is, is I think it's blue. It's red. It's the opposite of everything I think is the way to go. If I think I need to turn left, by God, I better turn right. I, you know, because my thinking is the problem. And I mean, if, when, you, when you take people like us and we work so hard to manage these three circular areas with all this stuff going on, you know, how can you possibly tell me that my thinking is the problem? My thinking is got, what got me where I am today. You know, look at me. My goodness. Here I am all alone, surrounded by empty vodka bottles. Uh, she's long gone. I don't know what the hell happened to my marriage. And, uh, well, I'm not feeling so great, but, I, I mean, there's nothing that I can't take care of myself. And uh, that's quite a package, you know. And it takes a lot of work to manage our lives when we're actively living in alcoholism. Now, that's, that's drunk, okay? Let's talk about sober. Is it really any different sober? If you take uh, the drink away... I've heard our disease described as uh, to not drink is to only make it worse. Ask yourself, what's my sobriety like? What's the quality of my sobriety? What is my relationship with, like with my higher power? Where do I stand up? Where, how do I stack up with my relationship with my higher power? That's a question for each and every one of us to ask. Um, I didn't touch on page 52 tonight in, the, in this chapter, but there's questions on page 52 that start with, am I having trouble with personal relationships? And then goes on to ask me a, no, a number of questions. It's an excellent place to go in terms of measuring the quality of my, my sobriety, uh, my spiritual condition, or just measuring what degree is my life manageable or unmanageable, depending on how I line up with those questions. It's an excellent exercise to write out where I stand with those current questions in my life. It always comes back to the same thing with me. How connected am I to my higher power? Um, I mentioned earlier, um, in early sobriety, the group was my higher power. And I got so much out of meetings. I went there to fill up my tank. And uh, I was surrounded by a lot of enthusiasm, a pocket of of, of enthusiasm, if you will. Uh, I had a great sponsor, got me through the work. I had an experience. And then I was all fired up to try and tell everybody how great this thing is and what they need to do and what they're doing wrong and my way's the right way and all that evangelistic, you know, mad dog type of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. That was, that's me. You know, that's me. I'm, I'm enthusiastic about this program. And I, I have been because it really it gave me my life and my life back. And I say it all the time, everything I learned about living life, I learned in Alcoholics Anonymous. I got here when I was 40. 
And I thought because I was managing these three areas of, of, of information that I, I really had it together. So, what was I saying? Was I? Geez, everybody's here. I better have something to say. So, Managing the three areas, the bedevilments, right, okay. So I've got to ask myself, where do I line up with my higher power? What does that mean to me today? And I know for my own self, personally, that this is an, this is an endless journey, that it has nothing but growth potential. It can go wherever I decide it, it, it needs to go. In other words, the more I put into it, the more I get out of it. The more I try to seek God, and the, and the key um, adjective here is seek. The more God will be in my life, the more promises I will get, the more effective I'll be in helping other alcoholics, the better my personal life will be, my relationships. Um, I'm recently um, married, again. And, uh, and, you know, that was a big thing for me at this stage of my life, uh, to get married. And... Um, I thought that I was doing really good out there, you know. I felt like, you know, I'm, I'm practicing these principles and I'm growing spiritually, you know, and I'm feeling pretty good. And, I mean, put me in a relationship and it's like, whoa, what, I mean, what happened here? I mean, talk about testing this program and practicing these principles in my personal life. You know, at the end of the day, what do we all really want? You know, we, we, want, we want love. We want intimacy. We want partnership. We want to feel connected to another human being. We want to be loved and we want to be able to love. Life is all about relationships. And if you're in here tonight and you're, and you're single, you, you're probably hoping to find the right person. And if you're in here and you're married or you're in a committed relationship, it's all about making that relationship all it can be. And, and whether I'm, I'm sober or... I'm not drinking, you know, has really no bearing on really the, the quality of my relationships, whether that's with my significant other, my brothers and sisters, co-workers, my boss, people in AA, my sponsor, my sponsees. These are all the relationships in my life today. And just to the extent that I avail myself and seek this power that the second step talks about, are my relationships right-sized? It's amazing. You know, I've got a problem with a person. What do I, what's my instinct? Well, I've got to fix that. I've got to go tell them I'm sorry and explain to them what they did wrong and make everything right, you see? <laughs> you with me? But today, the answer is step back, take a deep breath, ask God for the strength and direction, help me do the right thing, remove my fear, direct my attention, Prayer, prayer, prayer. Step back. You know, share it with another alcoholic, someone who has spiritual license in my life. Help me get clear. Do I owe an amends? What is it? How do I approach it? What do I do? You know, because, again, just because I'm not drinking doesn't mean that my thinking is all straightened out. It's not. It's a, day, it's a daily endeavor. If I want to stay recovered, okay, contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. Every day is a day when I must seek the will of God in my life. This program is amazing. And I have to always remind myself. And you see what happens is the ego rebuilds itself. I'm okay, right? The great lie in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm okay. I'm okay. If I'm saying I'm okay, I guarantee you I'm not okay. All right? I'm either great or I'm not doing good. You know, and not doing good could be like a train wreck. That's another thing. No, I'm not doing so great. You know what that means. It's horrible. You know, the feelings of fear-based feelings are, let's say, unmanageable. The unmanageability of my life manifests inside of me. That's why the, the, we, we seek God. The answer is deep down within. That's where we seek God. That's where we find God. I have to bring it in. Always bringing it in. Inward. And that means meditation and prayer and sharing with other alcoholics, people in this program, who I can be honest with, who will give me unconditional love and direction to do the right thing or help me see what the truth is or the answer.
I can't live life today successfully on my own. There's absolutely no way. And that's a huge admission. And it's a huge part of step two. For a guy who spent his whole life trying to manage everything on the outside, trying to make it look right, and it did look right. It looked the way I thought it was supposed to look. It was, it was the colors I thought it was supposed to be. It fit in the box that I thought it was supposed to fit in, or at least the one that I thought you thought it was supposed to fit in. It was a job. It was a car. It was a house. It was the wife that I worked so hard to get, so much convincing to get her to leave her husband so that I could get divorced from my wife, and then we could get married, and then she leaves me. I mean, you talk about an, a, a mess. Uh, it was just, you know, the reality of that was incredible. And here I am, 14 years sober, what have you, and I get married again. And uh, it's completely different. It's completely different. And, you know, those first two women were wonderful, wonderful people. And I could, I could be married to them. There's nothing wrong with them whatsoever. There's something wrong with me. And as long as I avail myself to the information in this book and I do what's indicated in front of me in Alcoholics Anonymous and I seek a power greater than myself and believe that that's the solution for my life, exponentially my life continues to just get better. It's not, I'm not saying that my wife and I don't have, you know, occasional misunderstandings and hurt feelings, but the approach to the solution with that it's so different. And um, I'm enjoying my life now like I never enjoyed my life. And uh, I'm happier than I've ever been. All I really look forward to every day is being happy. And the one thing that I want to leave you with that really works for me, and I think it applies to step two, it's certainly a spiritual principle, is that leave the results up to God. I don't need to be responsible for the results. What I need to be responsible for is doing the things that I've been laid out in front of me, practicing these principles, okay, in all my affairs to the best of my ability in any given day. But don't be in the results, the results of any area of my life. All I need to be is honest, self-expressed, and leave the results up to God. With that, I'm going to close, and we'll open the meeting for anybody who'd like to share or ask a question, okay? Thank you. give you my interpretation. Uh, I don't know exactly what Bill meant, but um, what I believe he meant was we're insane when it comes to the first drink. Yes. In other words, my mind tells me that it's going to be okay or whatever series of compromises I do. I compromise everything for that drink. I'll compromise and sacrifice everything for that first drink. I have a problem, mental obsession that tells me that the first drink or drinking is good. And that's the insanity. What I've found in sobriety is that insanity manifests in many other different areas of my life. I'm also insane. I'm insane in relationship to the first drink. And that's what Bill's talking about in terms of getting sober and finding this power. But being sober, I can also take that and I can identify that with other areas of my life where my thinking is insane. Um, same thing. Be honest, self-expressed, and take what you get. You know, and of course, that's not what we want to do, is particularly with a relationship. I don't want to go there because I might rock the boat. But if we don't rock the boat, it'll never, ever get better. We have to deal with the things we don't want to talk about. And those are the fears that block me off from, from God's power, love, God's way of life. I have to be able to find the ability, the power to be honest and self-express. I don't have that power left to my own devices. That's why this work and my one piece of advice and I don't, would be to get a sponsor and go through these 12 steps and then address your relationship issues. In the meantime, put that aside and put everything you have into this and see what happens. I'm definitely not a relationship counselor, that's for sure. <laughs>
I don't necessarily have an opinion. I could have a point of view. Maybe we could talk about it after the meeting. That would be best, I think. I think the honesty starts with um, being honest with myself that left to my own devices, I will drink. That's the first thing. And that I am, my life is powerless and unmanageable. Okay. And then I have this threefold disease. If I'm honest in those respects, that's, what do I do now? Like, the, like tonight, what now? Get a sponsor and get honest with another person in this program and trust in the process. And over the course of those 12 steps, I think the honesty starts to come. Yeah. It starts from within, and then I need somebody to help me see the truth. That's what I would say. Mm. Without it, I, I'm not going to go any further. Uh, or, you know, I might take the third step and take six months to write a fourth step and you may never see me again. So if I don't have that cornerstone firmly in place, which is simply believing in a power greater than myself and really to my innermost self, believing that I need that in order to recover. That's the most important aspect, I think, when we're new in Alcoholics Anonymous or maybe even when we're not so new. In other words, 14 years separated from a drink. It's not about a drink for me today. It's about the quality of my life. So that cornerstone needs to be someplace where I can go day in and day out and have that connection with this power where I can get quiet and prayer, meditation, you know, do my, my morning, you know, um, 10th step and set up my day for the day. You know, what's my ideal for today? What's my defect for today? What am I working on? Be aware of who I am. I'm not willing to do that if I don't have that cornerstone because otherwise it's not going to work anyway. It has, no, it, it has no effect. So I have to have that cornerstone in place, which means I got to believe that without this power, I don't have a chance out there in this world. No way. I will die an alcoholic death and I will drink as a way of life. That's, that's I have no option. I don't know if I answered that, Ian, but... I think the, their spiritual awakenings, plural. <clears throat> That's been my experience. It, it better, I better keep having experiences or I, I might not hang around. See, it's, everything's about what I do today. So you did a wonderful thing. In, in your heart, you felt compelled. You want your father to have a better life. You want him to, whatever it is that you, your ideal is for your dad, you can only, you know, maybe lay that at his feet and be a living example of what this program does for you. We're not good at being evangelists um, or overly enthusiastic in terms of our awakening in this program. But what we can be effectively is living examples of people who are you know, legitimately happy. Power, peace, happiness, sense of direction in their life. You're an example. Anything other than that is not good. I want to just say real quick, um, my mom... She was seven years sober when, when she passed away. My sister's 25 years sober in this program. And those two never, ever said a word to me about this program, ever. And it's a good thing they didn't. Because if they did, they would have spoiled it for me. Because any, they didn't know what they were talking about. Anything that they said, I just, just you know, discarded. You know, was, they didn't know what they were talking about. They're, they were idiots. So they were my mom and my sister. I mean, come on. But so when I got to AA, I, I wasn't skewed. I had no prior perception whatsoever. I was like so raw when I went into my first meeting. It was, it's ridiculous. It's a beautiful memory, but thank goodness that they never tried to, you know, put the word on me. You know what I mean? So a living example is where it's at. Well, I don't know who your sponsor is, but a suggestion could be to find a few guys in this room who uh, want to do uh, the steps together in a small group and uh, go work with them. You can still work with your sponsor, but you're going to move along with the group um, very rapidly and uh, you, can, you can have that experience. He can still be your sponsor and you can tell him, you know, I decided I'm going to work with this group. Nothing wrong with that. My sponsor told me, Pete, go out, do the steps with other people, have new experiences. You feel you need to move on? Move on. Don't compromise your recovery. Just if you have your, comp absolutely. 
find people in AA who are doing this. That would be my suggestion. I think that's all we've got time for tonight. I want to thank everybody again for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.